so what are some of the tenets of bad modern writing as far as you've seen them emerge from all of the sort of reviews that you have done? Uh, okay, how much time do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> Critical Drinker is one of the most watched TV and movie critics on YouTube. He is known for his honest takes on woke ideology in the media. Today we talk about how politics has ruined Hollywood, the five sins of bad modern writing, and what actually makes for a good story. It's not that I don't enjoy criticizing bad films. The thing I've always strived for is to be fair with films. If I watch it and I enjoy it, I really want to be honest and say so. Because if I can't be honest and fair, like, what's the point of me doing this? Will, Critical Drinker, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Wonderful to have you. Thank you for having me, man. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. All right. So uh, we were just chatting, and I wanted to understand. You sort of elaborated a bit. I, when I look at the channels that do sort of uh, movie reviews with a degree of social commentary, yours is crushing it right now. Like, I mean, I, I see it crushing in views. It seems like you're surging in popularity. What do you think is contributing to that? I mean, I get lots of, you know, people talk to me about this stuff. And, you know, there's there's various bits of feedback I get. But I think the overwhelming one is you've put what I was thinking into words. You know, and I, I think that's probably the secret to it. It's uh, It's not like I'm you know, some genius that's providing insight that no one's ever considered before. I think it is just, um, I've found a way to articulate people's frustrations, uh, whether with mm. movies or TV shows, or just like modern culture or whatever. Um, and there's something really cathartic about that. Hearing someone rant fairly eloquently about something that's been bugging you for a while and really just putting that into words. Uh, one, it's just a bit of a release of emotion. And I think two, um, it's always good to know that like you're not on your own with this stuff because mm -hmm. you know myself and probably a lot of other um, movie critics that came up in the past few years uh, I think we all probably experienced that feeling at a certain point of um, am I going nuts you know am I crazy or are movies really getting worse is there actual problems that are cropping up here um, and what you eventually realize when you get into that YouTube space and you, f you find there's lots of other people who agree with you you're not nuts. There is problems there. And it's good to point that out. And, you know, the thing I try to do is provide that catharsis for people. But also, you know, I've got a background in writing myself. And so I like to think I've got a little bit of like technical expertise on how stories are put together to try and bring some of that to the fore and say, well, here's a similar movie that did this same thing much better. And here's the reasons why. And so give people a point of comparison and help them to understand where stories can go wrong if they're not properly put together, you know, and it's, yeah. it's a little bit instructional for them, you know, it helps them. Did it require when you were starting, because right now there's this moment of, you could call it woke backlash, where it's more popular or even safer to say, I don't like the way that they're uh, just mindlessly race swapping or the way that the girls win without any sense of struggle, whatever, whatever, like the message is inside these. When you were beginning to make these, do you feel that it required a bit more bravery on your end to make some of the commentary that has become, it seems a bit more popular today? Bravery or stupidity, I'm not sure which one, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think back then, like, because, yeah, I was just starting out with my channel and I didn't have anything to gain or lose. Like, I just didn't give a shit. And so I was just there to voice my thoughts. And that's what I kept mm -hmm. doing. Like, I just want to be honest with people about the problems as I see them. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah, back then, perhaps there was less awareness of some of these problems. And, um, you know, you did get a lot of pushback at times, but the still the overwhelming majority of comments and, and uh, feedback that I got from people was positive. And they said, you hit the nail on the head. This is exactly what I've been feeling. And man, the number of times that even now I get people in the, the, the um, movie industry, the video game industry, like contacting me and it's the usual like you know don't share my name or anything but like <laughs> i i 100 percent agree with you you know and you don't know what it's like having to work with all these lunatics but you know that, that's that's the the world that they still live in you know to speak up for them is pretty much career suicide so um you yeah. know we've got a bit more freedom as youtubers i suppose well, I mean, I, I guess I hear what you're saying. It felt brave for me to uh, watch, perhaps as somebody with an established audience. And one of the reasons I made this podcast when I had Charisma on Command is because Charisma on Command was, and I'm glad, 
entirely apolitical, had no perspective on the news, um, and you you know tried to find positivity even in the situations where somebody was being negative. And I felt that when I was receiving messages and the DMs from people about what was happening, that I that my perspective on the world at the time was very misunderstood, <laughs> and so. That's partially why I made this podcast because there were things in which I aligned with you where we would do movie reviews and be like, I, I hate the way that this story is told or I hate that they felt that the most important part of this was swapping the male lead for a female lead uh, and then insisting that the story would be identical except that she would struggle less. And I'm thinking, for instance, of Star Wars, which you've covered at length and how Ray's journey to Master Jedi uh, lacks obstacles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah and the thing is as a writer you can break that down uh as the nuts and bolts of storytelling like if the mm-hmm. if the protagonist has got no obstacles to overcome then they've got no journey to go on and so you don't empathize with them because they're not struggling through anything you know it's simple mm-hmm. stuff and yet you tell that to people and it's amazing still the reaction from so many people is oh you just don't like her because she's a girl it's you know with those people you can't really you can't really rationalize things with them but yeah Fortunately, the majority of people are more level-headed. Yeah, I'm curious. I've made my list in watching your videos, but uh, if you had, let me see if I pull it up here. So what are some of the bad or, or the tenets of bad modern writing as far as you've seen them emerge from all of the sort of reviews that you have done at this point? Uh, okay, how much time do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, like we just covered there, the, the tendency to um, take an existing uh, property uh, and swap in a, a female lead who's going to replace the the old um, worn out male lead, uh, but she'll be better than him at everything. You know, we, we've sort of talked about that. Um, the injection of humor into everything, like we we call it patented Marvel humor, because you know that that kind of quippy. You know, we're going to make light of every situation that we're in, so the audience doesn't think too much. Um, that really took off in the Marvel films, and it seems to have slowly infected everything. Like I can't stand mm. when movies just don't let an emotional moment breathe for a minute and let the, let the emotion sink in with the audience it's like no we have to we have to make a joke to move on you know um, yeah as much as i like guardians 3 and i did like it i felt that that was uh, often happening in that movie where it was we would just swing wildly from emotional scene of raccoon dying with 24 hours to the gang goofing off in some mouse's kitchen <laughs> it yeah. was just like where is where is the seriousness of this mission that we're on yeah, yeah. Um, and it just gets worse and worse as time goes. Um, what's the other things? Probably, um, you know, the, the really clunky insertion of social politics into things. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that's, uh, that's another big bugbear because, you know, previous generations of screenwriters, they knew how to, mo- they knew how to work in social ideas and stuff that you could, you could invite the audience to consider. That was good. You know, it's good to get people thinking. There's a big difference between that, though, and just straight up telling them, you have to think this particular way, and if you don't, you're a bad person. And it feels like we've gone way down that other road now with movies, where it's just about um, the the writer's got some hang-up over something, and they're just going to shove that into um, into into their storytelling. Um, and it very much just becomes about the messages that they want to get across, rather than the story that's there to be told. Yeah. Um, yeah, what was other things? Um, yeah, <laughs> shows that are like, how can I say this? Like, conspicuous diversity is probably the best way to put it. Like, for example, uh, you've got like some fantasy show set in a medieval village, uh, and and it's clearly set in like a sort of northern European setting. It's cold, it's wet, uh, and yet you look around and the the people there are like the population of downtown LA. You know, there, there's <laughs> black people, there's Asian people, there's Middle Eastern people, there's white people, all mixed in, and there's no explanation for how all these wildly different people ended up in such a tiny little place. The only mm. explanation is the meta of the the writers just wanted loads of diverse casting, and they couldn't think of a way to make it smart, so they just shoved it in and uh, hope people wouldn't notice. So stuff like yeah. that. I mean, that's more of a casting thing rather than a writing thing, but you know, it's it's all just stuff that annoys people, I suppose. Let me see if I have, uh, I've written a few more down. I want to just make sure that you got all the ones that I noticed in yours. Oh, you've talked about this. Subversion for subversion's sake. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Like, can we do, like, somebody has found a way to execute this hero's journey beautifully, but that's been done. Let's do it differently than they did it without making it 
like Jon Snow, for instance, at the end of Game of Thrones, like we've set him up to be the guy who's going to slay the Night King. What if he just didn't? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. like, these are the sorts of questions that seem to get asked and seem, I suppose, brilliant to some people, but make the story feel uh, hollow and like I was um, almost like uh, like my time was abused in getting to know these characters and listening to these prophecies and, and being uh, the foreshadowing that was set up for that. I think, yeah, I agree. Um, when you do stuff like that, you're setting up a kind of uh, contract with the audience, uh, an mm -hmm. agreement that you're going to provide them some kind of uh, emotional fulfillment at the end of it. Um, and if you, it's fine to do the unexpected because this is this is the confusion that people have. There's a difference between subversion and just doing something unexpected. Um, the unexpected thing is fine, but you have to find a way to justify it and make it a, a workable part of the narrative. Uh, whereas when you subvert something for subversion's sake, you just do something completely out of left field and it, it doesn't provide then that emotional release for the audience. It doesn't provide any sort of satisfactory ending for them. And so you've broken your agreement with them. And people, yeah, the the Game of Thrones season eight was a perfect example. Um, you know, people were wildly angry about that season. Uh, and we found it obviously in retrospect Partly it's just because the writers were eager to move on to Star Wars and they just wanted to wrap it up as quickly as possible. So they almost <laughs> just didn't care how it ended, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, like, this is this is a, a symptom of writers who think they're smarter than they actually are. Uh, case in point is Ryan Johnson. <laughs> you know, he thinks he's extremely smart. Um, but then when you get to something like uh, Glass Onion, which was his latest movie, I don't know if you've seen that. It's, yes, uh, I have. It's the sequel, sequel to Knives Out, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's all predicated on this idea that uh, we, we assume that there's some elaborate uh, conspiracy going on and that there's a criminal mastermind at work here. And, the um, you know, the, the Benoit Blanc, the detective, is tying himself in knots trying to uncover this, this great mystery. And it turns out it's, uh, there is nothing. Uh, he was just really dumb all along. And it's all just predicated on stupidity. Um, yeah. Not a very satisfying ending, especially if, like, the things you've shown throughout the movie kind of contradict that but you're just trying to rewrite history um again subversion for subversion's sake yeah i like what you said i, I forget the word that you use but what immediately came to mind is i've listened to brandon sanderson talk about writing and he talks about promises that you make in mm -hmm. in the early chapters and he even he discusses just for example like if you say that your characters are trying to get to x location and then you the, the reader expects and wants them to get to that location. Now they can take, they can be sidetracked, they can have other things, but if they never wind up there and there's a whole conversation about how important getting to that place is, we we go back and go, well, why did we have to read this whole discussion about where we were yeah. going? Like, it's not like real life where things kind of can happen seemingly randomly, where there's not a narrative thread. It does seem that the writers, uh, they just, they... We want our stories to have thread between them that connect scene to scene, give us a reason to to watch the whole setup to anything, and that's being lost. It's the it's the sort of postmodernist view of writing where mm. uh, there's this belief that well, classical tropes like the hero's journey, um, you know, archetypes that we've uh, we've come to love in our characters uh, are no longer valid, and so they have to be um, they have to be deconstructed and they have to be turned into something else, and so you can't just have like you say that contract that you've agreed with your audience where we our objective is to get from A to B, it might be via C, D, and E, but we're eventually going to get to that point. Um, a deconstructive view would say, well, they'll get to like Z and then decide that getting to B was never that important in the first place and they're more fulfilled mm -hmm. over there. You know, it's, it's fundamentally unsatisfying, but it's their constant need to deconstruct everything. And it brings me on to the, one of the other big annoyances I have, the deconstructed hero. Because nothing pisses me off more about a, a story than uh, we're going to go back to this old franchise, right, that you loved as a kid. Uh, we're going to bring back all these old actors and we're going to have them play their characters again. But now they're all shit and they, <laughs> they can't do anything. <laughs> They've given up on life or they're incompetent or it turns out they were never her like heroic in the first place. It was all a bit of a sham. Uh, and they're going to yeah. get supplanted by this new generation of characters that we've created, which are far better so you need to love our characters more because they're better. Uh, it's lazy and it's terrible. Do you think, and as you said that, I was wondering, do you think it says something about the current, I don't know, social milieu that we don't have many aspirational old people in our movies? Like the mm -hmm. this wise mentor, this person who has gone through life and is 
um, no longer struggling in the same way you would expect a lost 20 year old to struggle with identity and who they are and what matters. I'm trying to think, and maybe I'm just drawing blanks because of the conversation we're having, but I can't, I can't think of the Obi-Wans that have been there, done it, found some equanimity and are ready to pass on their knowledge to the next generation in the same way. All of the old people, the Luke Skywalkers, are these jaded, pissed off, I guess like the projection of what the writers think about boomers <laughs> these days. I, I, think, I think it really is. It, maybe it's a generational resentment that's at play mm -hmm. where it's like, no, we're better than you and you've, your generation screwed us over and like whatever, like maybe you made the economy tank or something like that and like we have to pick up the pieces. Uh, or again, if it feeds into that sort of postmodernist deconstructed view of uh, of culture, where uh, we want to tear down everything that came before, and so that means you can't respect the the previous generation because that generation is terrible, and you have to just take all of that away and start again. It could be that, um, but to go back to your point about you can't think of examples. Probably the only one that's come up really in recent years has been um, Maverick from from Top Gun yeah. too. Uh, there, and look how well that movie performed. It's like, finally, you just gave us what we wanted. We wanted to see our old hero come back, kick ass one last time. He's older, but he can still do what he, you know, what he used to do. And he maybe, just maybe, he can teach the younger generation a thing or two before he moves on. That's yeah. a satisfying story. It's not complex. It ain't Shakespeare, but it doesn't need to be. It's emotionally satisfying. Mm -hmm. That's it. And That's I all it needs. Yeah. I wonder what is this is perhaps too big a question, but like what what is the role of art? Is it and and I know there's a lot of roles that art could have and that story could have, but is it? Do you think it's to create an ideal towards which people can strive? Is it to describe the world as it is, or can it be both of those things? Because I'm thinking, why is Maverick a character or Tom Cruise in that that connects with the audience and with people as opposed to Luke Skywalker, who is just this pissed off, jaded, force projecting guy who disappears into nothing. Uh, yeah. Sort of like, why, why does he not have that? All of these, all of these different things, like essentially you can tell any story you want as long as it all comes down to the execution. I've always said, mm -hmm. uh, for me, the purpose of any piece of art, no matter what it is, whether it's a, a movie or a painting or a piece of music, whatever, the role of it is to engage the audience, engage them, make them think, uh, capture their attention, you know, take them on some kind of journey. That's that's what it needs to do. If you can do that, that then it's a winner. You know, and like I, I use examples. Like, not every movie is necessarily entertaining in the normal sense. Like, mm -hmm. um, you you watch something like Schindler's List. I wouldn't really describe myself as being entertained when I watch that, but it engages me and it takes me on an emotional journey. And so that's the purpose of it, and it succeeds in that. I think that the problem that we have with so many modern movies is that they they don't engage their audience because what they're what they're producing is hollow, uh, vacuous. Um, it, it seems to be ill informed, uh, poorly constructed, um, and it, it doesn't know how to do the things that uh, that classic stories should do. Uh, and that's um, that's the the big stumbling block that they keep running across with modern films the audiences aren't engaged with it they they know it as well they come away from the cinema fundamentally unsatisfied they can't always articulate why but they know deep down that what they saw didn't move them in any way and it didn't engage them yeah do you one thing that i have been unclear on is the uh, where the rubber meets the road in terms of economic ramifications of the decisions that these major studios and smaller studios are making in terms of their storytelling. So it's, it seems, at least on YouTube, widely recognized that Marvel Phase 4 was not uh, a hallmark of cinematic masterpiece, that people were disappointed <laughs> with their movies. As someone who has seen, I think, like pretty much every, every Marvel movie up until Endgame, it became increasingly easy for me to skip movies and not have it be to make a point or to like put my foot down, but just because I was genuinely not expecting to be entertained or enjoy my experience in my home or the theater. Uh, so do you, do you have any understanding of like, is that affecting them or, cause I've also seen that there's movies that people pan like Aladdin, the remake that I'm pretty sure made a billion dollars for Disney and was just like, yes, yes, yes. More of this. Yeah. They, they are a weird um, scenario. These live action remakes that they do because in any creative sense, you can pretty much just accuse them of bankruptcy because they're just rehashing the same story over again. It's like, it's the most uncreative thing you can do. It's like, we'll just take this original script, we'll just remake it in live action. Where's the imagination? Where's the magic that goes into that? Um, 
And yet, like you say, they make money somehow. Uh, I don't know if it's just parents who watched them as kids, you know, grew up in the 90s and now you're, you're you know, a parent yourself. And it's like, well, I want to have a bit of nostalgia and my kids will be amused for an hour or two. I'll take them to go see this thing because generally parents with kids are fairly easily amused. You know, I mean, it doesn't take a huge amount. Um, so there could be that aspect of it. Uh, it, there, there seems to be more of a backlash against the Little Mermaid that's coming out. I, I think because they've they've race swapped um, the actress and the the CGI looks pretty horrible. And it's I don't know. This could be the one that sort of breaks that that winning streak for these animated uh, or these live action remakes. Um, I know Cruella Deville didn't do well, but yeah, that happened in the pandemic, so you can't really apply normal rules to that. Um, mm. But yeah, outside of those, the economics do start to hurt them. I think because. I mean, what can you say? Like when you're spending um, 200, 250 million dollars to make one of these big Marvel movies, um, not to mention probably another couple hundred million on advertising, uh, you're you're needing to get to something like 800 million now just to break even at the box mm-hmm. office. And so um, if you're not making that, you, you can't keep releasing a product that's losing money for you. You know, it, it it's just not economically viable. You know, a company as large as Disney or a franchise as large as Marvel, um, they they don't just lose their momentum overnight, but eventually that that um, takes its toll. And it's happened at uh, companies like Warner Brothers, who made the DC movies. You know, they have had flop after flop. They never even like reached the heights of Marvel. They just kind of stalled on on takeoff, um, and they've been stumbling ever since to try and fix the problem. Uh, but with them, because they didn't have that success initially, they basically ran out of money. And so what they had to do was bring in a guy who's completely ruthless, who will say, right, this project, that project looks like absolute garbage. Kill it immediately. We're not even releasing it. You know, they had uh, a movie called Batgirl that was due to be out this year. Um, it was shot. It was all ready to go. They killed it and deleted the whole thing. It'll never see the light of day, probably. And it cost them almost $100 million to make. That was a $100 million write-off. Because they knew wow. it would cost more to release it to try and advertise it than than they would make, and so they said, "What's the point? We'll just kill it." Uh, wow. And so it, that's that's an example of where Marvel could be headed if they carry on like this. So the simple, uh, just so my understanding, the simple math they did was: there's a marketing budget that this is going to cost us, and then there's a what we'll get back is goodwill from putting this on our streaming and making people want to watch the universe. They did the math and said this is this is so bad that it's got none of that. Because I think what they can do is like if it get cancelled altogether and doesn't get released, they can do it as a tax write off because it's just an expense. Then so they do save a little bit of money from doing it, but yeah, essentially yeah. all that time, all that resources, all the people that worked on it, it was all for nothing, just a complete wow. waste because they knew it was shit and so there was no point in putting it out um, what is so that guy's come into dc has marvel had those internal shakeups inside um the company i know that bob Iger's back at disney i don't know how that impacts marvel i mean they they fired victoria alonso who um was a pretty senior she was probably like second in command almost at marvel um there's kevin feige and then there was her and she was responsible for a lot of the vfx side of things um, oh. which partly explains why their VFX look like garbage over the past couple of years. Um, and yeah, she got fired. So like, I think partly it was down to a lot of accusations that she was really difficult to work with and, and caused a lot of strife amongst her subordinates. Um, yeah, and partly, you know, she was perhaps a bit of a fall guy. But, yeah, you know, we, we, we'd have to see how well the, the thing continues to perform. You know, it might be that if they keep releasing flop after flop, then more people will get fired. You know, Disney themselves, they're, they're firing like thousands of employees or making them, you know, redundant mm-hmm. um, because they're losing money. You know, and um, it's, it's just down to their, their creative decisions that they've made. There's, there also seems to be a thing, which I, it exists in YouTube, it exists in Hollywood, which is you don't pay the price of your bad decisions immediately. So when you've got a string of movies that people like, and I think of sometimes the X-Men franchise where like first class didn't perform quite as well, but then the ones came after it, I think benefited from like what what an interesting new take that was on the superheroes. Phase four, I don't think suffered as much as it should have for, because it followed phase whatever, three in Avengers Endgame. But my guess is that when when you see the team ups between all of these new heroes whose names I honestly don't know despite having seen like the girl from multiverse of madness <laughs> yeah. um, the the uh, you know all the young female scientific genius 
girls that are now in the in that universe, I think that there will probably, my guess is, be a huge drop in the comparison of that with what would have been the Avengers team up from a prior generation. I mean, we're already seeing it. You know, like mm-hmm. um, Ant Man and the Wasp was was a real flop. Um, Thor: Love and Thunder, I don't think that did particularly well. Um, you know, you had a couple of the movies in in Phase Four that that outright flopped, but partly that was down to the pandemic at the time. Um, you know, Black Widow and oh, what was the other one? The Eternals. Yeah, they both did terrible numbers, but movie theaters weren't full back then. Um, but yeah, like the the. The numbers don't lie, and they that phase didn't even have Avengers an Avengers team up movie. It just kind of like petered out like a wet fart. <laughs> it's just <laughs> nothing to it, you know. <laughs> it was weird. Yeah, I I agree. So so what? I mean, it sounds like there's a couple different camps, and one of the things that I that has occurs to me as I watch your videos is that there is this silent. Um, center of the world this majority of people that you know decides whether to go spend their 20 bucks at the movie or whether to watch it on streaming uh i one of the clearest divisions of that is on rotten tomatoes where you see these audience scores that mismatch the critic score so tremendously do you have an understanding of how and why the the sample size of critics that are popular today so mischaracterizes the general movie going audience Oh yeah, um, with the critics, like a lot of this just comes down to like um, access. Like I think uh, Nerdrotic he refers to them as the access media, and it's exactly what it is. It's all quid pro quo. Like you give our movie a, a good review, hey, we'll make sure you get to the premiere, and uh, you know, give you all kinds of goodies and stuff like that. It's just you know, you get treated as the the favored critics, uh, but it's all contingent on you being nice to them, and so they're not gonna they're not gonna criticize these movies and. There's that aspect of it, and there's the kind of socio-political dimension to it, where um, <clears throat> a lot of them are, particularly if they're journalists working for major news outlets, they're probably going to be really strongly progressive and left-wing. And so, if you get a movie with like progressive politics in it, uh, like strong women or or tackling racial issues or whatever, uh, they will they will be very unlikely to criticize it because they don't want to get accused of being um, big aid or whatever it might be. Um, and so there's that as well. It's, it yeah. becomes like a shield for these for these people. Um, but then the audience members, they don't have any of those constraints. They don't have to impress anyone, and they, they don't need to maintain their access to things. They can just be honest. And so I trust the audience scores way more than I trust the professional critics. Yeah, it, and, and it, um, it also cuts, I'm thinking the other way, where you have things like the Dave Chappelle special, which are panned by critics because it doesn't match the socioeconomic thing that you mentioned and but the audience finds it funny and they and they enjoy it by and large yep the uh the one that's very popular right now that i would be remiss if we didn't talk about is cleopatra (laughs) 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 so have you watched cleopatra like i mean you you i god bless you you put yourself through uh you put yourself through it for some of these reviews that you do (laughs) is this one that you've actually sat down and, and looked at well, so for the video, I wasn't addressing the actual um, the actual show. Like, I didn't okay. I, I didn't want to talk about that because getting into a review of it would take you know it would like double the length sure. and stuff. Like, I would have to get into that. Uh, but then I did sit down and watch about the first twenty minutes of it, I think, mm-hmm. and then I just couldn't take any more. It was such <laughs> bullshit because it's like it, it pretty much encapsulates all the tropes um, that we talked about earlier. Like, if you've got a female lead now. Uh, They turned Cleopatra into this, like, sword-swinging warrior who's also, like, a tremendous uh, diplomat and incredible inventor. She's right about everything. She's incredibly forward-thinking, incredibly articulate. She can, like, she has all the men around her in the palm of her hand. Um, And they just made her into, like, a a 21st century girl boss. Like, she could have walked straight off a Marvel set and into this documentary. And, you know, that's what you would end up with. Um, yeah. And I thought, well, okay, like you know, because I wanted to give it a chance of like, what's your what's your historical basis for this? You know, like who are these experts that can shed light on this? And like, each one of them were basically like gender studies professors or like people who'd studied like Egyptian literature for like six months and then they they went into like you know feminism studies or whatever. And it's like they're not scientists and they're not, they're not like recognized archaeologists they're just anyone that the makers could find that would agree with the 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 thrust that they wanted to go for with this documentary uh and it's just mind-boggling that 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 now gets passed off as like a legit documentary that's been researched 
You know, yes. that's, that was the thing I talked about in my video. Because, hey, you want to make a film about her? Go to town. Like, you know, um, have her, like, on a, on a, flying around on a jetpack with, like, an iPad and stuff. Like, you just, you know, it's fiction. You can do whatever you want. Like, but whether it's a documentary, you've got that, that expectation that you're going to be grounded in fact and evidence and reality. And the ultimate goal of a documentary is to get to truth, you know? Uh, and if, if what you're doing is the exact opposite, it's like, no, we have a narrative we want to go for here. We're just going to find evidence or we're going to fabricate it that's going to um, support what we want it to say. That's really shady stuff to get into, you know? Mm. Well, so I think that's that's the backlash against it, you know. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I just in case the audience doesn't know, the backlash for people is that they they have race swapped, or I don't even know if that's the appropriate word. They are they are documenting that Cleopatra was a black woman, which is not incidental to it. At least from the marketing material that I've seen, that's like the a huge important piece for these filmmakers is that Cleopatra was in fact black. And you talk in your video about some of the backlash they received, not just from the American audience, but the Egyptian. <laughs> The Egyptian yeah. audience is super upset about it as well. Yeah, well, it would be like if they made a documentary about William Wallace or Robert mm -hmm. the Bruce, like Scottish heroes, you know, um, who are documented historically uh, and had them played by like a black man, for example. Yeah, there would be a backlash against it because it's like, we know they weren't. So why are you trying to like, why are you trying to claim these people as, as something else? Um, and yeah, I, I think the theory I had in my video, and I, I pretty much stick by this, is they did a previous season of this African Queen's documentary series, which is a good idea. It's all about like shedding light on on female um, black leaders throughout history, you know, that we didn't know much about, and so they can they can bring them to the the fore. I think probably the the first season that they did, it was essentially like a, a leader of like um, a kingdom in like the fifteenth century in like sub Saharan Africa that nobody's ever heard of, and so nobody watched the show. And I think what they thought was, we need a, a name to attach to this that will get people's attention. Who have, who's people heard of that's a famous African woman leader? Cleopatra, perfect. Like, you know, um, isn't, she, isn't she supposed to be, like, uh, Greek? No, nah, no, nah, we'll just pretend she was black. <laughs> <That'll do>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? It sounds like there might have been uh, like two levels of that, like one which is the cynical, we need this. And then also, I mean, you, you have quotes from, I think it's the, I'm not sure if it's the director or the producer. I wrote these down because I thought they were so gaslighty, which is, you know, for some people, it seems to really matter that she's white. Uh, I've asked Egyptians to see themselves as Africans and they're furious with me for that. I'm okay with this. It's this like, yeah. As long as I got what I want. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like we're going to we're going to make race the most important piece about this. And then when you tell me that we've got it wrong, I'm going to act like, like you're crazy. Like we have things like Bridgerton. We have things like Hamilton. We have these things that are like obviously period piece race swapped where that's the thing. And the difference is they're not presented as historical fact. They're rapping mm -hmm. in Hamilton. Bridgerton is a totally other thing. And there's a genre that, that can exist for that. And this could have been in that. I don't know why they felt the need and I wonder if it performs better for them to present it as, as a historical account. Yeah, I think so. I mean... Um the the question I always ask, right, is when, when you get something like that, when the person says, why is it so important to you that Cleopatra is white? I would just say, well, I don't know. Why is it so important to you that she's black? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, turn turn it around on them because it's like, well, you obviously went into this with a bias and a desire to, to turn this character or this, this um, historical figure into something she wasn't. Like, what was your motivation for it? And why was it so important to you? Like, couldn't you find other, like, um, laudable and... and uh, interesting black women from history that you could explore why do you have to try and take over this one it's like just mm -hmm. because she's famous you know um and yeah that's uh i don't know if this is a, a distinctly hollywood um perspective where people will say things like as you mentioned um i just i just don't know why these uh these egyptians uh, are mad at some idiot Hollywood director coming in who, who knows nothing about their culture and trying to change like important parts of their history and pretend like it's fact. I just, I just can't work out why that's making them mad. You know, it's so, <laughs> it's so stupid. It's like, Did well, again, like flip it and say like, okay, like we'll, we'll have Egyptians come in and rewrite American history for you and present it as a documentary. Like, how would you guys feel about it? You know? 
Yeah. Did did I understand? It might have been from your video. It might have been somewhere else that there is some sort of a lawsuit coming from Egypt, or did I misunderstand that? There is, yeah. Um, an Egyptian lawyer is is suing Netflix um, on behalf wow. of like the entire country of Egypt. <laughs> uh, basically, I'm saying you're misrepresenting our history. This is. Uh, I don't know what you'd even call it. It's not libel, no. but it's like, you know, knowingly spreading false information. Um, and yeah, we, we want damages or something for it. I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but I just think it's funny that like you're getting sued by a country. <laughs> uh, so uh, does that, does, so this, this might be uh, truly a cynical strategy to bring more eyeballs to a show that wasn't getting it. Um, I think also, not exactly in the same line, of Velma, which I know that you covered on your channel, which is the remake of Scooby-Doo, which completely redoes Scooby-Doo, craps on everything that Scooby-Doo was, which is strange because if, if you wanted to do a parody of Scooby-Doo, you could have made a parody. It didn't have to literally have the property, the characters, all of this kind of thing. So my question is, Velma's getting a season two. We don't know the numbers related to this new Cleopatra thing. Is there a good business strategy to this like let's just create insane controversy and get hate watching to, to like is any press good press for for some of these people i mean i wonder that myself sometimes like velma is a genuine oddity where i cannot fathom the thought process that went into that show mm -hmm. uh we we are going to take you know a pretty innocuous kids tv show from like the 70s and we're going to turn it into this horrible um hate filled uh, rant against like everything uh, in, in modern culture, like you know, especially like white men, you know, um, and, and yeah, like the, there must have been surely someone in the the studio or the the writing team who who put their hand up and said, "Look, uh, I don't think this is going to play very well. I feel like people are going to absolutely hate us for this." Um, yeah, uh, I I don't know how it works. I I genuinely because. As an artist or as a storyteller or whatever, surely you wouldn't want your name associated with something that literally everyone hates. Like Cleopatra, like is a perfect example. You know, the the even the critic score was like eleven percent. Like even they hated it. The audience score was one percent. I've never seen that before. I didn't even think that was possible on Rotten Tomatoes, but apparently it was. Um and so yeah, I just I don't know if that's gonna then translate into more views for the following season or or what? You know, it's, yeah. a, it's a strange strategy. I mean, I, I talked about fan baiting as a marketing strategy where, um, you know, Star Wars has done it, where they brought in, like, uh, characters like Reva for this Obi-Wan Kenobi show. Again, they made Obi-Wan Kenobi an, a broken down um, old man who's given up on everything. And they brought in a character named Reva, who's played by a black actress. Um, a pretty unlikable character who doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you break down her story. Uh, and naturally, there was a bit of backlash against her, you know, just accusations that you just wanted more diversity on screen and you didn't care how it was done. Um, but then they get to come back with, uh, well, you're, you're all just racist because of that. Uh, and so you have to support this character because if you don't, then you must be racist. Uh, and so that became a, a term known as fan baiting, where you deliberately provoke the annoyance of fans and you use the resulting backlash to defend your show. Because now nobody wants to criticize that show because they don't want to be accused of being racist. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's where it ends up. Um, but it's a short-term strategy at best. Like Ultimately, the animosity towards your show is just going to be enormous. And I always leaned on the, the idea of like, hey, here's a crazy thought. Why don't we just make something that's really good? <laughs> like, it might work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I wonder if uh, I wonder if fan baiting is a conscious thing or a subconscious because I mean I can imagine I make the show I think it's good and I'm the writers I'm sure are trying in their own way to do that uh, and then people hate it for my own sense of quality as a writer and self-respect why is that well is it because I need to go back to like the fundamentals of good writing and learn how to do it better or can I defend both my ego and my job by telling everyone around me this isn't a reflection of what I made this is a reflection of the bigotry of the audience and so yeah I, I, I wonder if it's a like a subconscious defense mechanism strategy to protect against valid criticism I mean it could well be for a lot of these people because yeah. you you know we're none of us are mind readers I don't know what goes on in their heads um, it could be that a lot of them you know, when they come into these positions, uh, they've they've never been told no in their lives. Like they've they've had it relatively easy because I think now um, 
particularly, it's it's relatively easy to get into these fields because if you have the right views, you say the right things, maybe you tick the right boxes, uh, you're much more likely to get hired by Hollywood productions now. Uh, and so you, you can get these people with relatively little experience or skill in a lot of cases um, who have been essentially coddled their whole lives and told that they're amazing and they can do everything. Uh, they They get put into a show like this, they have to write for it, and then it gets panned, and they just don't know how to handle it because this is the first time they've encountered legitimate criticism in their lives. And so it almost uh, it creates like a cognitive disconnect for them. They're, they have to find a, a rationale for it. And the rationale is, no, it, 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 what I made was great because everyone told me it was great. And so it must be the fans. They must just hate it because they're bigots or, or whatever. You know, It becomes a very easy defensive mechanism. So for a yeah. lot of people, I think it will be that. Uh, YouTube is a good teacher for that because there's no, you, you get the views, you get the reaction of the audience. It's very direct. I'm glad. Yep. I'm, I often, I, I know some people, I live in LA who, who work in those larger corporatized things where you're not selling to an audience, you're selling to your studio head or your boss or your something whenever you're trying to talk about what's good. And there's a disconnection between the feedback of the audience and you, the creator, the writer, whatever it is. I'm I'm glad to have come up on YouTube where there's no space in between me and the audience. If something doesn't hit, there's no one else to blame. There's no one else to ask for feedback. It's it's not my can't I can't say that my boss didn't let me do it right. It's just me and the view count, and that's it. Yep. And it's you know YouTube's a harsh mistress sometimes. Yeah. You know, and yeah, you can you can put your heart and soul into some videos, and for whatever reason, they just do not land. And mm -hmm. you, you look at that little. That little graph, you know, where it's like where it should be and it's way below it. And you're like, why? What's wrong with this one? What's gone wrong? Um, and it's frustrating sometimes, but it happens. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, a, a good a good content creator should always be aware of how their audience is receiving things. And, you know, always like evaluate it and, and think like, OK, what can I do better next time? How has how has YouTube? Because I know you've had this this tremendous success as the critical drinker. You also have your own uh, work as an author, a novelist. Uh, how how has that supported your work? Has it been has it taken you away from your work as as a novelist and an author? Tell me, I, I'm just curious what you've got going on there. It it, it does become quite hard to because writing a book is quite a lengthy process, as you mm -hmm. probably know. Uh, for me, it takes at least six months to get the the first draft of the manuscript done. Uh, and that's six months of like working every night and, and it's kind of hard to do that when you're also producing videos and you're responding to like emails and Patreon inquiries and you're doing live streams and all the other things that come with being a, a YouTuber. Um, and so, yeah, it has impacted it a fair bit in um, over the past couple of years. Like I've had one other book come out uh, last year, um, which I'm very pleased with that came out um, and, and I did the, the sort of the writing for that um, as my channel was taken off. Um, haven't got any more plans right away to write another book just because of this reason. I've got too many other things happening. Um, and yeah, I'm working on a movie for a short film, should I say, for um, for my book series uh, that we crowdfunded. And um, yeah, again, that's taken up a lot of my time because there's a lot of production that goes into that. So yeah, it does it does impact it, but it did uh, it did a lot of good for like the sales of my existing books because it's like mm -hmm. ten novels that I've got out. So you know, even if I don't write any more, I can say, well, I wrote 10 books. Like, so that's quite a lot. <laughs> like, I feel good about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell me about that because I one of the things that I see with authors is that it can be such a long road to recognition. I mean, like, it's um, I, we mentioned Brandon Sanderson earlier. Even though he succeeded early, it takes time to get that momentum. And then once you have that IP, now it's like, oh, great. Now you get, which is cool, you're George R. R. Martin, and they want to make a show. They want to make a movie. They want to do everything, yeah. and you're in your twilight years. So do you have that hope, aspiration? Um, is that a th like you're, you said you're making this short based on your books. Is that a direction that you would like to push towards or do you do you yeah. just have you have your 10 books and you're you're good no i mean uh damn man like i like movies and i like write, writing books and so if i can combine those two things uh awesome you know and mm -hmm. like i think every author wants to see their books get turned into a movie you know they want to imagine like wow my characters are actually going to be on screen you know they become almost like a tangible thing you can see then yeah um so yeah like i think uh i definitely want to see that happen so yeah, we're we're working towards doing that. Um, but yeah, like the the relative success that I've had on YouTube, it's um, it's obviously helped the sales of my books. It's raised the profile of them. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, going back to the, the question that you asked of, like, before all of this, what's it like being a writer? Um, it's tough, man. Like, the, the fact is, most writers, when they get that first publishing deal, they, they might get, like, maybe a two-book deal, something like that. Um, those books come out. They don't, they don't hit the targets that the publishing house set. Uh, and that's it. You get dropped. And you might never get another deal again because they know that you're not necessarily a big seller. And so they'll be very reluctant to, to take you on again. Even, even if you change your, your pen name, you know, they'll still mm. know who you are. And so uh, it's, a, it's a pretty brutal industry. Um, like for every J.K. Rowling, there's, there's tens of thousands of wannabes who, who only sell like a few hundred books. Um, that's yeah. the harsh reality of it. Are you self-published or have you gone through those traditional publishing routes? Uh, traditional publishing, yeah. Okay. Um, because when I was starting out, it was there wasn't really the self-publishing ecosystem that you have now. Like I, I started out like 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, in fact. And so it was a different landscape back then. And so really the only way in was to get traditionally published. And I was lucky. You know, I found an agent. I found a publisher relatively quickly and got published. Um but yeah, like even I had my ups and downs as a writer. Like I, you know, some books didn't do as well as others. And you always wonder like, well, is this going to be the last one? I'm only halfway through my series. I want to get to the end of it, you know, but I was lucky. I suppose I got through to the end. Did you get through? To, so I'm, I'm genuinely interested. I, uh, as a kid, thought I might be an author. Didn't pan out that, but have, you know, all my half written lazy story ideas. So uh, did you finish the series and did you come to a your satisfying conclusion for your character in your 10 books. I was, yes, I was lucky enough to do that, yeah. That's uh, amazing. It was nine books in that Ryan Drake series, and then the 10th one I did was just a bit of a standalone thing that was something different. But uh, yeah, I was with a, a good publishing house, and uh, they, they kept me on all the way to the end. They let me tell the story I wanted to tell my way, uh, and I was very lucky and very happy that I got to, you know, give it a good send-off. So, That's yeah, amazing, please. and I'm sure... I'm sure that you're seeing this, but right now you have a, with, with your raised profile as a critical drinker, uh, I, it just seems like a real possibility versus if you were just stuck to the traditional publishing things, okay, you've got your 10 books, that could be it. I, I do get the sense that if you continue on the path that you're on and you, you know, let people know that you do have these books, that you really could have the movie in a couple of years or, you know, a, just a, a larger book sale profile. So I'm, uh, I'll have to check them out. I'm, I'm excited for you. Thanks, man. <laughs> I'll send you cool. some free copies. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm a Kindle guy. Well, if uh, before before I get into them, just give me the uh, broad. Uh, what's the synopsis of these sort of books? Like, what, what? Who are they for? What? What type of book is it? Okay, they're like action thrillers. So they're all mm -hmm. set around uh, you know the, the clandestine war on terror because they they're set maybe um, ten fifteen years ago back mm -hmm. uh, during you know the the post nine eleven world. Uh, and the main character is a guy named Ryan Drake who works for the CIA. Uh, and the role of him is that uh, if one of their agents or their sources should go missing, get captured or turn against them, you know, go AWOL, uh, he and his team are sent in to retrieve them, um, find out what happened to them and bring them back. So they could be sent anywhere across the world. They could be in like South America, Africa, Afghanistan, Iraq. You know, you never quite know. Um, and so each of these... Uh, novels will take them to a different place to to find someone, um, but there's a big overarching storyline uh, regarding like conspiracies going back all the way to the Cold War, uh, and um, one of the the people that Ryan Drake rescues is a woman named Anya, who's who's a a veteran of the agency, um, and she's been held in a Russian prison for like the past ten years, and so uh, when he breaks her out, he, he learns a lot of secrets about what she was involved in and how it all ties into this big conspiracy i'm probably not doing it justice but i'm always no, no. describing my own books <laughs> that's great that's great no i i i have the genre in a sense in a sense for it um you know it sounds jason Bourne ish jack reacher ish yeah. with the with the clandestine element to it uh very yeah. cool so other than your own work of course what is what is working for you and is good in in the modern you know television uh book world well um or in movies TV of course yeah, in TV terms, uh, man, Taylor Sheridan on um, on Paramount Plus is really killing it. You know, he's the guy who made like Yellowstone, uh, okay. 19, 1923, um, Tulsa King. You know, he's doing mm -hmm. all these shows, and they're uh, they're great because they don't go for any of the modern day politics or anything. They are just good kind of old fashioned storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, so they are they are good stuff. 
um, and I've been very much enjoying them. Um, House of the Dragon with it's set in the Game of Thrones universe. Yeah, uh, love it. Th- that really surprised all of us because we, <laughs> you know, we thought, oh, God, you know, Game of Thrones was a nightmare when it ended. Uh, this just feels like another project to keep George distracted so he doesn't have to write a book. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it came out, and it's like, wow, this is smart, and it's got great characters. It's mature. Uh, it's well done and patient. Uh, brilliant, love it, and looking yeah. forward to season two. So that's good. And Cobra Kai, that is. Oh yeah, it's my my favorite show of the past <laughs> few years. I just love it. It's it's so gloriously stupid and and silly, uh, and yet there's such heart to it. And it's just it's fantastic just seeing all these old characters come back. And um, yeah, great fun. Um, I actually got to meet uh, William Zabka, who plays Johnny, like the main character. Um, oh, cool. He was at a, a convention I was at, so that was one of the great moments of that weekend. <laughs> just meeting him. <laughs> it's a legend. Did you did you battle your sensei when you met him? <laughs> I did. Yeah, it's like I, I, uh, I shook his hand and I was like, man, it's just uh, it's a real honor to meet you. And uh, thank you, sir, for for the work you've done on this show. It's awesome. So, so cool. yeah, he was, he was a cool guy. He was good. That's awesome. The um, when you were talking about House of the Dragon, it occurred to me we'd mentioned earlier that there's not a lot of aspirational older characters, and of course he's you know totally gray. But Viserys in that, especially you know a little bit of spoilers. The uh, the march to the throne, uh, oh, yeah. demonst- demonstrate. Oh my God! Right, right in the feels. Uh, the a different kind of strength that was like an old person strength, like a strength yes. of, of character in that moment. I thought was uh, beautifully done. His final speech, too little, too late to his family, but still, like th- that. That was a. Um, a failed patriarch in many ways, but it demonstrated aspirational qualities, which I thought was like, oh God, that's like, you get to the tail end of your life. This is where you want to, this is how you you have been for longer. I I could honestly make a whole video just about that character. What an interesting character study and what a great arc he goes on because, you know, his, his whole thing throughout his early life particularly is that he didn't really want any of this. Like, he probably would have been happy just like being a lord, a country lord of some like mm. little estate somewhere and just making his models and, you know, just being with his family. He just wanted his family around him more than anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's got this tremendous responsibility put on him, um, struggles with it. Not a strong man necessarily at first. You know, he's quite um, easily swayed by others. Um, and he's obviously wrestling with this this degenerative illness that's gradually making him weaker and um and frailer um but it's almost like the more physically weak he becomes the more his strength of character comes to the fore and he becomes this this tremendous um uh leader uh who who basically gives up everything for his family um and yeah like you say every every time you see a a, a character struggling to do something like some task like that that you know is so important to them but they they refuse help and stuff it always tugs at the heartstrings it's just it's human nature uh and so the show yeah played that scene perfectly and it's all helped by a great performance by by paddy considine the actor that played him so yeah yeah viserys was a great character i would 100 percent watch that movie the as soon or that movie that video as soon as it dropped i, I would love that uh yeah. <laughs> just, just just to relive that that arc which i found yeah exactly just like you said so touching um so if you do make it, <laughs> you've I got my I vote. I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, when and this is a last sort of thing. I'm I'm making a Dungeons and Dragons show. I've been paying more attention to story. It's it's collaborative storytelling. It's improvisational storytelling. Um, but I'm finding that there's uh, you have to make decisions sometimes about what comes first, and not that they have to compete always. But is it character, or is it plot, or is it a really interesting set piece? And not that there's a single right answer, but I'm curious when you've in the media that you've watched and in your own writing, do you have where do these stories come from when you find that they're the most solid when they're that when they have I don't know the most heart? Yeah, it is a tricky one. It really is because huh, it, it's tempting. I think the mistake that a lot of writers make is they have a plot in mind that they want to happen and Mm -hmm. they've got their characters that they've set up. They've got personalities that they find interesting or whatever. Um, But those characters and the the things that they would reasonably be expected to do in certain situations don't always fit into what the plot needs them to do. And they they quite often try and bend the characters um, to do things that they shouldn't be doing or making decisions that they wouldn't make normally. 
Uh, and that's when you know you've got you've written a bad scene, and it's happened to me plenty of times. I've had scenes where it just there was a feeling that something just wasn't working right, uh, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it at first. And then it's usually when I take a step back from it, you know, go and think about it for a while, and I realise I'm having a character act out of character. I'm trying to make them do something that the scene needs them to do to move the plot forward, but it's not something they would normally do. And so that's when the eureka moment comes in. And I realize I have to restructure the scene in some way. I have to make this fit better with what characters would do so that it feels like the, it's like a jigsaw puzzle where all the pieces finally fit together. That's, that's the way I liken it. And so I, I always go character first and then plot, you know? And, and with your characters, when you're going character first, what, what are the building blocks of a strong character? Um, I'm trying to think how best to sum this up. I mean, a lot of it is is almost intuitive. Um, the best way I can describe it is that I just get a sense of who this character is. Um, and I, I honestly would struggle to tell you, like, how do I create a character from nothing? Like, where, where does it come from and how do I begin to form them? Um, I think most of the time I just think of, like, okay, where's this person from? What do they look like physically? Um, wow. Well, what sort of what sort of things about them? What's their general personality? You know, are they are they very cool and analytical? Are they passionate and fiery? Um, you know, what is it about them that I find interesting? And once I've got that that core of what their personality is, I just start to build it out, and I can say, well, okay, if they if say they are easily provoked by people, why? What is it in their life that made it like that? You know, what's their backstory that helps to fill in and and inform who they are now? Uh, and then where did that backstory take them to? What's their path that they've taken through life to get them to this point? Uh, and you, you, yeah, so it's like you start with the skeleton and you gradually just put meat on the bones and you gradually fill it out with more and more detail. And then, you know, sometimes as you're going through the story, ideas will come to you and you'll work that into their backstory and, and you get more and more of a sense of who these characters are. And I think for me, when you know you've written a good character, you know what they'll do in basically any situation. You you plop them into any random situation and you know how they'd react because you know who they are as a person. Yeah, and it also, as you were saying that, I thought of <laughs> not this would be Ray, who is it seems like the writers like you know they needed their Mary Sue to like do the thing, but and somehow she was on a desert planet and yada 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 she grew up and without parents and there doesn't seem to be like no like what was her life like prior to wi- us starting this film? There's no personality, Where, yeah. And, and yeah, there's they, no they, connecting they, thread between any of it. So any we can go back and retcon anything because don't worry, we haven't decided what happened in the first 19 years of her life. Exactly. Like if you were to say right now, like what, what does Ray do in her spare time when she's not out saving the galaxy? I couldn't tell you. I don't know because I don't know what she is. I don't know what her personality is. I don't know what interests her. I don't know what she finds enjoyable or what she hates because there's nothing. Like you say, there's no personality to back it up. Uh, she is just a blank canvas that can do whatever the plot needs her to do. Mm-hmm. That's a bad character. Yeah, plot first, after character. Cool. That's that's uh, very helpful. Well, awesome. Those are. Uh, let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to touch on before we uh, wind down here. We got sure. you. Oh, the the last thing that yeah. I wanted to ask you was um, your experience of making these videos. There. Well, actually, there's two. There's two things in here. Um, there is a section of YouTube to which I don't necessarily think you fall into, but I think of like the Ben Shapiro, um, Matt Walsh, the, the more conservative thing that get at, that gets outraged often. Right. So it's like, what was the most recent ad campaign? And, and now we care about it. So all it was Bud Light and now it's Miller Light and it was Gillette many years ago. Uh, and it seems that there's a huge lucrative career to be made getting upset about whatever these advertising things are doing but i wonder about the uh the damage to one's own experience of life (laughs) when we're watching commercials all the time looking for the things that piss you off and i don't think that you're necessarily that but i can imagine that that having a critical eye to entertainment or anything like that you know might might have an effect so i'm curious how you enjoy your job as or if you even conceive of yourself as a critic and and how you enjoy that yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not in the sort of category that they're in where I'm like a social commentator or anything like that and like, mm-hmm. you know, finding every piece of outrage bait that I can find. Um, for me, the the secret is balance. You know, I say if I've, I've had a, a run of um, 
bad movies that I've reviewed, like just because they they just happen to have been some crap films coming out. Um, I'll purposefully seek out one that I know is good, like whether I have to go back, you know, a few years and find a better movie or whatever, uh, to balance it out a little bit. Because I almost have to remind myself, like, movies can be good. Movies can be really fun, (laughs) you know, and they can move you and they can excite you and they can do all these wonderful things. Uh, And I just need to do that every so often so I can make a really positive, happy review where I can just enjoy myself. Uh, and it's it's not that I don't enjoy criticizing bad films because, like I said earlier, there's a catharsis to be found in just you know really tearing something <laughs> apart. But I don't want to do that all the time, and I don't want to be like permanently outraged because, like I think you said there, it, it can take you down a bit of a dark path where you can end up just being kind of pissed off generally, or you go into movies then expecting the worst because you're so used to it, it becomes like a reflexive action, and I don't want to get to that point. Um, yeah. the, the thing I've always strived for is to be fair with films. And if it's good, you know, even if I don't like the director or, you know, the, the trailers made it seem terrible or whatever, if I watch it and I enjoy it, I really want to be honest and say so. Because if I can't be honest and fair, like, what's the point of me doing this? Got it. So you are enjoying this this uh, this critical drinker persona, which, you know, <laughs> we yeah. took the glasses off. We've seen the man behind the shades today. <laughs> like, I have eyes. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and then there was actually, I'm curious, I, I had a pet uh, a pet theory, if you will, for why some of these, have you followed the Miller Lite, Bud Light thing at all? Is that, is yeah, that at all I'm, within your sphere? Uh, I'm aware of what's been happening with uh, with Miller and Bud Light, yeah. So I know I know the advertising campaigns and the, the backlash against it. Yeah, and you remember the Gillette one from years ago, which was this, <laughs> yeah. the beginning of toxic masculinity, right? <laughs> yeah, boys will be boys. Yeah, boys will be boys. <laughs> hey, bro. That, my, my friends and I constantly do that to each other. Hey, bro. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we check God. each other. Um, I was trying to figure out, you know, sort of in preparation for this, if there was an impact, as we talked about with the movies, does this hit them in the pocketbook? And I, and I dug into Gillette a little bit. I couldn't find an impact and then I looked up Bud Light and it looks like Bud Light sales are down like 20% or something like that. Mm. Um, and again, I, I don't know if you have a deep, uh, a deeper understanding, but it seems that some of the internet outrage about entertainment or product or advertisement or whatever translates and some of it doesn't like the Aladdin example that we talked about. And I don't know if you have any insight into this, but do you have any idea why some of these hit and why some of these don't? It's an interesting one. Uh, like you say, I thought the Gillette one might have had a bigger impact because, man, that pissed a lot of people off. Yeah. Like, I, I wasn't involved in YouTube or anything back then, but uh, I remember it just watching that advert and just thinking, fuck off, Gillette. Like, stop, <laughs> Like, how dare you, like, tell us that we're, like, toxic or, or that we need to be fixed or that we have to do better. It's like, you sell overpriced razor blades. Like, stick to what you're, you're supposed to be doing, you know? You're not here to provide social guidance for us. Um... But yeah, like with the with the Bud Light stuff, I just kind of think like if you mess with people's beer, like <laughs> that's where they're gonna. <laughs> and I I think as I understand it, you know they they got this Dylan Mulvaney person in to um, to advertise it, and that's a pretty divisive personality anyway, as far as I know. Um, and you know it, it's it's perhaps more accepted uh, if it's amongst the you know rich people in Hollywood or whatever or very liberal people. But like who who's gonna drink? you know, Bud Light, it's it's going to be working class guys, like at the end of a tough shift, like they're going to go to the bar and they'll get a couple of buds, because, you know, that's how you, that's how you unwind. Uh, working class guys ain't going to have time for people like Dylan Mulvaney, you know what I mean? So, like, <laughs> I think that association uh, just, oh, it created a bit of a backlash, I think, for them, and yeah, somehow it just seemed to snowball, you know? It really yeah. did. Um, I th- and yeah, like you the, say, I think the their only sales thing are I way could- down. The only thing I could sort of come up with was that uh, Gillette is consumed privately and Bud Light is often consumed publicly. So there was there seemed to be like sort of a social aspect of I wonder if Gillette sold beer and had the same ad campaign. But, the, you know, instead of razors, it was a beer at the end. If Gillette would have seen the same, you know, next week, next month dip. But like you're like, all right, whatever. Am I going to make a point? If nobody can see me making this point, do I actually change my consumption habits? Uh, that's the yeah. best I could come up with. But, it could well be, yeah. Like uh, peer pressure is a thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but very cool, man, dude. Wonderful chatting with you. Where can people find you? We talked a little bit about your books. Yep. Uh, well, I'm usually hanging around YouTube making making videos. Uh, so yeah, under the Critical Drinker, you can find me on Twitter. 
Uh, mm. And if you're interested in checking out my books, uh, they're called the Ryan Drake series, and they are available through Amazon and most good uh, bookstores. So yeah, take a look. Maybe you'll enjoy them. Wonderful. I would. I would also, to the degree that you're comfortable, encourage you to talk about it more because I only. I think I only found it from your one Kickstarter mentioned video that you were doing. Um, that you were making that short, and I think uh, I'm looking for stories that I connect with and it sounds like we have a similar understanding of the importance of character and the types of tales that we like told so um, I'm looking forward to receiving my free copies <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what I can do <laughs> awesome well wonderful chatting with you man thank you so much thanks man